Okay, well, my name is Jason Del Gandhi. I'm one of the co-chairs of this panel. My co-chair is on the end, Kristen Bellini, correct? Kristen Bellini. And the title of our, our panel today is Communication Activism, the Presence of Our Futures. And in brief, the panel is exploring different aspects of communication activism and social justice scholarship with a particular eye in terms of how these particular subfields relate to the wider discipline of communication studies, right? So for instance, how does communication activism actually relate to the wider field of communication studies? How does social justice scholarship relate to the wider field of, of uh, communication studies? And in particular, the panelists are going to talk about different aspects, but there may be some aspect of reflecting upon the history of the di discipline. There may be some aspects of thinking about the current contours of the, di the discipline, as well as some reflections or speculation about the future of the, the discipline. So how might we think about the future of comm studies in relationship to social justice, social organizing, social change, activism, et cetera? All right. We have uh, six panelists. Or six, the six panels is showing up now. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> and so I'll just do. I'll just briefly introduce everyone, and then we'll go on from there. So first up, we will have Lawrence Fry. Right. Then we will have Stephen Hartnett. Who was in the wrong room? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for showing up. It's fine. Then we have Spoma Yovanovich. Then I myself will talk. Jason Delgandio. Then we have Billy Murray, and then last but not least, my fellow co-chair, we have Kristen Bellini. All right. all right, so thank you for all attending, and I look forward to the discussion afterwards. Also, just as a side note here, we all agreed to keep our presentations to about seven to eight minutes. That way we can um, have as much discussion and dialogue at the end about these terms, about these issues, about these different aspects of social justice and activism. All right. button. From the economic inequality uh, gap to the amount of poverty to the number of people incarcerated um, in the United States, uh, having 5% of the world's population but incarcerating 25% of the world's uh, prisoners, to the discrimination shown against so many people, uh, blacks, Latinos, immigrants, those who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered, um, there certainly is no shortage of significant social justice issues that confront us. Indeed, we could spend the remainder of this session just listing those injustices, but that's not necessary for agreeing that the need to confront such issues directly and vigorously never has been more apparent and important. If you look it up in the dictionary, it defines activism as a doctrine or practice that emphasizes direct vigorous action, especially in favor of or opposition to one side of a controversial issue. Now, one could engage in direct vigorous corporate activism to, for instance, make IBM or BP more money or engage in civic activism to get more people to vote or even engage in social injustice activism to further discriminate and oppress particular groups of people. The type of activism that I'm concerned with has to do with promoting social justice, which I've defined elsewhere as engagement and advocacy with those in society who are economically, socially, politically, and culturally under-resourced, and add your favorite L-Y word to that list. And I've spelled out some of those characteristics. Hence, I'm talking about activism for social justice. Now, I'm not talking just about activism for social justice, but about activism for social justice scholarship. Only recently have that, those terms, activism and scholarship, been associated together. And there are many, many reasons for their lack of association. On the research side, the academy has shifted from confronting community problems historically, which was a fundamental purpose of many US colleges and universities, like the colonial colleges and land-grant universities, to being powerful research engines that privilege research that's directed toward a relatively small, insular group of fellow scholars. With such research taking very much of a hands-off approach, um, I've argued in terms of because of privileging of theory, which if you look that up is derived from the Greek word theoria, meaning contemplation. So scholars are supposed to be 
people who serve as spectators, whose work is best done by looking at and contemplating what occurs without trying to affect it. On the teaching side, activism and scholarship has not been associated because of the corporate context that now pervades US education, which has re resulted in today's market-based education with li relatively little focus on democracy proper. However, there are a critical mass of scholars across virtually every discipline in the humanities, physical sciences, and social science who have started to talk about activism and scholarship together. That focus on activist scholarship, both research and teaching, rather than on activism per se, is fundamentally important because if I wanted to be a full-time activist, I would not be here talking with you today. I probably would be outside protesting against something evil that NCA is doing right now. <laughs> I also am not talking just about activism for social justice scholarship, but about communication activism for social justice scholarship. On the research side, communication activism scholarship means communication researchers employing their resources, their communication theories, research methods, pedagogies, and other practices to promote social justice. On the teaching side, it means communication educators teaching students how to use their communication resources to promote social justice. Communication scholars are in an ideal position to engage in activist scholarship because activism fundamentally is a communication process and practice. Communication activism for social justice scholarship thus is a unique form of scholarship that uses the very essence of the communication discipline, communication theory and practice, most notably pedagogy, to promote social justice. Whether there are other unique forms of activism for other disciplines, that is a political science or a sociology of activism remains to be seen. Now the verb to promote social justice, however, is less clear and open to interpretation. And the panelists up here probably do not agree about its meaning. If we think about the promotion of social justice being a continuum, the minimum or weak side would be scholarship that studies and teaches about activist groups engaged in promoting social justice. That descriptive focus is historically has characterized many forms of communication research, social justice, uh, social movement studies of the 1960s, um, applied communication, feminist research, cultural studies and critical studies. It's also characterized communication pedagogy in the form of, for instance, critical communication pedagogy. That descriptive focus, especially when it employs a critical perspective, is extremely valuable to promoting social justice writ large, but it does not carve out a particularly unique space for communication activism for social justice. Hence, I've argued for a stronger form of that on the social justice continuum, in which communication scholars work with community members and social justice support organizations organizations to intervene into unjust discourses and attempt to reconstruct those discourses in more just ways. And especially in the case of research, but also teaching, document the practices, processes, and products of those interventions. And in a series of books, three books I've articulated and highlighted how communication scholars have employed and taught students how to use communication interventions, such as communication skills training, group communication techniques, debates, public dialogues, media campaigns, performances, public relations, to attempt to decrease things like domestic violence shut down confined animal feeding farms, prevent capital punishment, confront poverty. Although all of those interventions certainly have not successfully accomplished their intended goals, they successfully demonstrate how communication scholars can engage in what Kevin Kerrigy and I have called first person perspective scholarship, as opposed to third person perspective scholarship, where scholars get into the stream and do something about it, build a dam to keep with the metaphor, for, for instance, rather than being content, and I use that pejoratively, to stand outside the stream of human events and describe, interpret, critique, explain, maybe offer recommendations for what's going on there. One clear advantage of doing that is that communication scholars potentially can make a difference through their research and teaching rather than hoping that some difference will result 
from their teaching and research, hoping that someone else will do something with it at some time with what has been studied with little evidence that that actually is the case. I have no doubt that all communication scholars want to make a difference, and this type of scholarship is one of the very best ways for doing that. Um, it is grounded in communication theories. This is an exciting time. Uh, we hope with the creation of a new division about that, and especially for intervention-oriented research. For a very long time, I've wondered whether communication scholars were part of the problem or part of the solution. I firmly believe that the creation of, we hope, this new division tomorrow, and the work that will emanate from it will show that communication researchers and teachers can be part of the solutions to the significant social justice issues that confront us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my apologies for being late. I was in the wrong room down the hallway until Larry texted me. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to have this kind of topic on the conference program. And it's wonderful to see over the past 20 years how this kind of topic has proliferated on our programs. I remember about 20, 25 years or so when I started first coming to the NCA, you didn't see the word justice in the conference program. And you didn't see the word activism in the program. And now if you look through the program, you see it on darn near every page. So we're clearly trending in a very positive direction in terms of this kind of work. And I want to take this moment to say that it's trending because of Larry Fry. When I was a young man doing a PhD in the 1980s, my department chair brought me in to the office to said, what are you doing? You, you can't do that. And then I met Larry in Chicago, and Larry was like, well, of course you can. <laughs> and he's been doing that to generations of young scholars now for 20 years, publishing our work, editing our work, pushing our work, shaping our work. And so I really want to turn to Larry Fry and say thank you for making this conversation possible. <laughs> so I want to try to talk about four things quickly. And I... Uh, I think if we can do these four things well, then we will be happy as a community. And obviously the first part is scholarship, because as Larry said, we are communication activism scholars, and publications are the corn of the realm. It's how you're going to get published. Uh, it's how you're going to get promoted. It's how you're going to get grant money. It's how you're going to accrue the cultural capital to help you do the work that you want to do in your institutions and communities. So it's really important that we continue to push the boundaries of what we think is great scholarship. And that can mean working in interdisciplinary ways. That can mean, as Larry said, first-person scholarship. But I think we need to really push ourselves. It's not enough to do great work in the community. And it's not enough just to have a great story to tell. We have to tell those stories well in the best scholarship possible so that what we call communication activism will become recognized not simply as on the margins of the field, but really at the heart and center of the field. And, and that will only happen through more and better scholarships. So that's the first thing I think we want to focus on. The second thing is pedagogy. As Larry said, there's a continuum of debates between civic engagement, social justice, what kind of activist are you, how do you do it? And the funny thing is that we really don't know how to teach that, do we? And it's especially hard to walk into a classroom if you think you have an answer. Because your students, of course, aren't going to want you to be there preaching at them. They still expect it to be a fair debate. And so we need to really expand our concept of what does it mean to teach communication activism. How do we do it? How do we handle it? What are the boundaries of it? I'm dealing now on my campus with risk issues, having constant conversations with my campus's lawyers over what are the risk issues of taking 12 students into a maximum security prison? What are the risk issues? We got about 200 freshmen this year who are doing work at homeless shelters all across Denver. Well, what are the risk issues of having them out on the streets on a cold night handing out food to homeless guys? So we need to think about the risk issues. We need to think, uh, think about the training issues. How are we training our students to do social justice? Because if we send a bunch of young people out into the community 
who don't know what they're doing, they're likely to harm themselves. They're likely to harm the people they're working with. They're likely to lead to bad press. So we really need to think about what kind of training are we offering to the young people that we're saying, hey, let's do social justice activism. So we've got to think about the training that's wrapped up in the pedagogy. Third thing I think we really need to think about is the question of institutionalization. How is communication activism and social justice work embedded in our curriculum? How does it account for master's degrees and PhDs degrees? How do we accredit students who want to do this work? What do our deans and chancellors and provosts think of when they hear this kind of language? Do they provide funding for it? Can you get uh, tenure and promotion on this question alone? Are there grants for it? Are there awards for it? Are there outlets for it? Are there enough sessions at the national conference? So we need to think about how it is that we're going to institutionalize the work we do. Now Saturday morning is going to be a good start in that because we're talking about a, a new division for the NCA along these lines. I think that's going to be very exciting if it happens. But we need to keep that momentum going and talk about is it time for a journal? Is it time for a book series? Should there be awards at this convention for this kind of work? Should there be grants for this kind of work? Should the National Communication National Office think about having an endowed chair in social justice, for example, someone who could take a semester to live in Washington, D.C. and do this work and take it up to the federal government? So we really need to think about how it is we're going to institutionalize the good work we're doing at a grassroots level at multiple levels of the discipline. The fourth thing that I want to talk to you about is the question of our partners. The work that we do in communication activism is only as strong and robust as the partnerships we build within our communities. And I don't know how many of you are experiencing this in your own work, but what that means is that for every hour that I spend writing about this, I probably spend 10 hours out knocking on doors and working the phones and answering email and just trying to find out who is in my community. What are their needs? What can I do to help you? And as often as not, those conversations persuade me I can't work with this group for any number of reasons, not because I disagree with them, but maybe because they don't need what I have to offer to them or what my students can offer to them. And so the partnerships are the foundation of everything else. In my case, I'm partnering now with the Colorado Department of Corrections. They're the people who run the prison system into which I take classes. And I, I cannot tell you how hard that partnership is. It's an unbelievably complicated bureaucracy. The turnover rate is 50% every year. Think about that. I'm trying to work with a massive bureaucracy where every year 50% of the people I work with cycle in and out of those jobs. So constantly rebuilding those partnerships. And I can't tell you how tiring it is. And I bet a bunch of you in your own work, you know this. I see people are shaking heads. It's just hard to maintain those relationships. And so this, now if you think about the scholarship, the pedagogy, the institutionalization, and then this final question of partnerships. The trick is how do they interlock? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm rocking along on, on one of those, but my partnership is falling apart. <laughs> or I'm working good on the partnership, but I'm spending so much time on the partnership that I'm not getting any writing done. Or class is going great. You're just loving the social justice part of what you're doing in the classroom but you're spending so much time grading essays that you're not working on your partnerships. So what I want to try to say is that if we can get all four parts working together, that's where we're going to hit that sweet spot of scholarly success, classroom excellence, building our institutions, and the key part, nurturing those robust community partnerships. If we can do all four things, then this discipline will continue to grow and thrive, and I think we'll all be very proud of the work we do. So thank you very much. Well, I want to echo what uh, you've already heard today, but I think it's important to say it anyway, that um, no doubt Larry Fry has made a tremendous dent in uh, NCA and in the lives of so many people, me included, and I do appreciate that. There are also people um, on this panel and in the audience, students uh, and colleagues who we read their work, 
we learn from our students, and I, it's, it's really been phenomenal and uplifting in work that is hard, I have to say activism, but rewarding, right? So I wanna, I, 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 we've had a great introduction and in history and looking at the big picture, and I'm gonna kind of uh, drill down into some of the things, uh, well, particularly one issue that I've been struggling with of late, okay? So most of my research takes me into the basements of churches, uh, maybe the living rooms of poor families, uh, sometimes into the classrooms of urban high schools that a lot of people don't want to go to, and even into, I would say, fledgling nonprofits, the kind where, you know, the, the upholstery on the chairs are often ripped, maybe the paint is peeling off the walls, and everything's a little bit, I, I'd say, mismatched. Well, these are the places, though, where the real struggles are going on, right, for for equity, for dignity, and for social justice. And so it's there that communication activists have to go. Now, not surprisingly, in these places, in these spaces where we meet with grassroots activists, uh, we, we come to lean on the notion of collaboration, right, with our partners. And the great thing about activists, community activists, is they're really, really good at collaboration. They've got it down. They know that they have to bring in people to bolster what is always under-resourced work. Um, they need collaboration to expand their influence and to work through those modifications of process and product so they can bring more people into this struggle for a better, richer life. But you know, what I'm learning, what I'm experiencing is that collaboration is not always as it seems, and it's certainly not easy to sustain. So in, if, and I think if our discipline is going to increase its impact and relevancy in this work of social justice, teaching, and research, that we really need to reveal collaboration, the call for collaboration is both, I would say, a hopeful gesture, but also sometimes, unfortunately, as a shameful practice, as an unjust discourse. So what do I mean by this? Hmm. Well, you know, as a hopeful gesture, we know collaboration can build trust and great relationships when we're working together um, well and when we're listening to each other, interacting at, at that level. But as a shameful practice, what we see is that sometimes collaboration is suggested as a way to thwart expressions of dissent and disagreement. And we use, or some, and I hope I don't, but other people sometimes use the word collaboration to invoke a message of control. Let's just get along, right? Let's just move forward. So as communication activists, I think that um, we will better serve our communities and our students when, when it's necessary to really ask, our, ask ourselves and each other to, to pause and maybe not just ask, maybe demand an honest assessment and a careful consideration of those questions concerning power, unequal access to information, and other interaction features that really have to be addressed before we can collaborate in any meaningful kind of way. When we hear, let's just collaborate, all too often it's code for, come on, drop your objections, Let's get on with it. And it's that call for what I would say submission, acquiescence, and passive obedience as collaboration that is really shameful practice. And we need to call it out. So here where we, we are uniquely situated, right? Because collaboration is a critical communication competency. And and still, even though we know that, let me just back up a second and say that activists are often um, criticized for doing this kind of work, right? Because it's slow. They seem disorganized. Like, when is it ever going to happen? And what I see instead, and I think this is where we can come in to really work with our students, is to, to recognize that what activists do so well is take the time to really create the connections and work through the difficulties 
that can lead us to the collaborations that we want. And I want to call that notion, um, the thing I've been really working with uh, my students over the years, and I still need to refine even more, is this notion of struggling together. I think a lot of people want to shy away from the notion of struggle, as if it's bad, it's hard, and so let's not do it. And I would say, yeah, it's hard, but all the reason more to do it. So struggling together, to me, is, I don't know, the, the quintessential ethical communication. Because what it's saying is that I have a profound desire to interact with you, even when it's difficult, even though we sometimes have differing or even opposing views and positions, and even when I have to concede a bit, when I really don't want to, <laughs> I will say, when I really don't want to, but, but I will in order for us to move forward in the most positive way in order to take the next step for social justice. Struggling together paves the way for, I think, those difficult conversations that we need to have, and that in turn presses us to better articulate our values and the reasons that we do the work that we do. And because collaboration is not easily achieved, we need to teach about, we need to model in those first-person perspectives, I think, that Larry was talking about. And we need to practice this struggling together as ethical activist practice. Thank you. Hi, folks. Thank you all for attending here. Uh, thank you for the pre previous uh, speakers and the panelists. And for the next few minutes, I would like to talk about um, a notion I've been thinking about the past couple of years, and I refer to it as social movement literacy. So again, social movement literacy, which again, it's a new term that I've come up with the past couple of years. And actually, um, I'm, I feel lucky right now. It's the first time in the past couple of years I've actually sat down and forced myself to think about this concept. So everything I'm going to say over the next few minutes is completely tentative, and you know I, I engage. I, I look forward to discussion, debate, critique, etc. Right. So this notion of social movement literacy first has two touching points for myself in terms of personal experience. One, I teach a class every fall entitled "The Rhetoric of Social Movements." Right. And every semester I teach the class every fall, I'm always amazed about how little my students know about social movements. And when I say that, I'm, I'm not passing any moral judgment on my students whatsoever. And I say that because when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I knew nothing about social movements, literally. Um, I, I remember the first time I went to graduate school, my first semester, someone asked me about something about social movements, and I said, what is that? Right? Now, this is quite ironic, given the fact that now, this, at this point in my life, my life is dedicated to social movements, activism, social justice, et cetera. Right? But I, th I think that's instructive, though, in the sense, why do so many folks Know, know so little about social movements when, in fact, social movements have made invaluable contributions to American society. Right? Almost every right, liberty, and freedom that we hold dear as Americans have come by social movements, activists, organizers, so on and so on and so on. So I, I recognize that there's a gap between the reality of social movements and then our knowledge of social movements. Right. Then the other uh, touching point here in terms of personal experience was during the Occupy movement. So I was part of the Occupy movement, Occupy Philadelphia, etc. And one of the common criticisms of Occupy wasn't really a criticism rather than a statement. What are they doing? I have no idea what these, these guys are doing. These people are crazy. It looks like chaos, so on and so on and so on. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with Occupy, but the idea that you can't understand why people would occupy Wall Street to me is baffling. Right? Uh, Wall Street is obviously the epicenter of, of corporate power around the world as well as in America. And then if you think about the relationship between corporate America and our political system, I think it's obvious. Right? But again, I think that was instructive in terms of pointing to this gap between the reality of social movements and then our knowledge about social movements as a collective. Right? So having said that, what do I mean by social movement literacy? Well, again, it's all tentative, but right now in terms of a, a preliminary fashion, I would say that social movement literacy tries to help educate the general public on how to properly read and understand the nature and function of social movements. Right? Now from there, I, I draw out three different insights. Number one, social movement literacy is a public pedagogy project. In other words, it exceeds the institutional boundaries of the academy and it seeks to have wide social influence. 
Number two, because of this, social movement literacy should involve collaboration between scholars and activists. In other words, each side brings something unique to the project. So for example, scholars might tend to highlight abstract knowledge, while activists might tend to highlight experiential knowledge. Now, I'm not suggesting a false dichotomy here, but rather, each side highlights, a different, uh, excuse me, each side highlights different skills and knowledges that could and should contribute to social movement literacy. Then number three, the skills and knowledges that are unique to social movement literacy must be transferable across movements. So again, I'll say that one more time. The skills and knowledges that are unique to social movement literacy must be transferable across movements. In other words, social movement literacy is not reducible to learning about a handful of specific social movements. Instead, social movement literacy establishes a set of core skills and knowledges that enable people to recognize, discuss, hopefully participate in, and if need be, intelligent, intelligently critique the ideologies, political motivations, and tactics of social movements. Right. Now from here, I've tried to think about different skills and knowledges that are necessary for social movement literacy. So right now I have six tentative skills and knowledges. Number one, social movement literacy cultivates the ability to recognize and articulate the specific conditions that make possible the emergence of particular social movements. In other words, how and or why does a particular social movement emerge when it does? Right. Number two, social movement literacy cultivates the ability to recognize, analyze, and understand the verbal, visual, embodied, and or mediated communication of social movements. Number three, Social movement literacy cultivates the ability to recognize how framing can influence perception and understanding of social movement activity. So for example, how do social movements frame themselves and or how do mass media outlets frame, frame those social movements and then how often do they come into conflict? Number four, social movement literacy cultivates the ability to identify and understand social movement tactics with an emphasis on civil disobedience and direct action. Now why do I say that? Why that emphasis? I'm going to assume that the average person most likely can understand why someone would stand on a stage at a political rally and talk about a political cause. Right? At the same time, though, I'm not necessarily sure that the average person has the skill set, not the intelligence, but the skill set to properly read and recognize why someone's going to occupy Wall Street, why someone does a sit-in, a die-in, things like that. In other words, and really it's a focus on embodied rhetoric, at least from, from my background. Right. Then number five... Social movement literacy cultivates the ability to switch between one's own political worldview and the worldview of various social movements. In other words, a shift into the worldview of that particular movement. Now, that's not to say you have to agree with the movement, but rather shifting into that worldview allows you to understand why that movement is doing what it does. And number six, social movement literacy cultivates the ability to discuss and debate the pros and cons of different social movements and the complexities thereof which potentially produces a more informed, substantial, and robust conversation. Not just amongst individuals, but I'm thinking large scale in terms of a society. So how might we actually create a society in which the average person has the skills and knowledges to actually talk about social movements in an informed manner? Right. Then I'm going to uh, end with the political agenda of social movement literacy. So I agree, and I'm also going to assume everyone here agrees, that all education involves a political agenda. Right? So what is the political agenda of social movement literacy? And I would argue that social movement literacy seeks to, one, desensitize people to the presumed otherness of social movements, and two, cultivate empathy for those who collect collectively fight for social justice. Such, desensi such desensitization and empathy create conditions for the possibility of more social movement activity, and that's the overall goal. In other words, how can we nourish the ground to produce more social movement activity? Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much for being here. I'd like to begin by extending a thank you to Jason um, for asking me to be a part of this panel and to Kristen for doing an enormous amount of work organizing this panel and drafting our proposal for a communication activism and social justice division. I'd also like to thank SPOMA, Larry, and Stephen, not only for their continued mentorship of me individually, but for their mentorship of many other junior faculty members seeking to do communication activism scholarship. So today I'm here to talk a bit about activism and the politics of the academy, particularly for those of us who are still untenured or junior faculty. I'd like to do this by addressing some of the typical advice given to junior faculty members and add in some of my own experiences and advice. My advice is neither sage nor revealing, <laughs> but it is my hope that it will serve to prompt conversation among all of us here about the risks, um, to echo Stephen, the challenges and rewards of pursuing communication activism scholarship. So advice for junior faculty number one, publish or perish. I would like to begin with an example from my very first journal submission as a junior faculty member. In this manuscript, I wrote that, quote, possibilities for public discourse and political action are opened up, and within this context, these issues must be questioned and debated. After waiting four months to hear from this national communication journal, I received an email from the editor. Citing that passage specifically, the editor stated, it becomes clear that your primary contribution is polemical. Let's resist power, I'll show the way, which is not this journal's primary mission. And for that reason, I won't be sending your manuscript out for review. After four months. Those sentences, I thought, seemed pretty mundane. Um, uh, certainly not as polemical as, say, talking about Bush's bumbling empire with its ever-mounting pile of failures. <clears throat> <clears throat> Stephen Hartnett in Larry Fly's uh, edited volume. Um, so my advice, remember that some editors just aren't ready for the polemical nature of terms such as public discourse, political action, questioning, and debate. Seek out those outlets that are ready and most importantly, seek out mentors that encourage activist scholarship. For example, the badass social justice mentors. Uh, this looks familiar to a couple people on this panel, so I'm gonna let them take a look at that. Um, the flyer that they sent out many years ago. Um, seek those people out, because they are what nourishes this division, or soon to be division, let's hope. So despite my initial setback with that article, I want to make sure to note how grateful I am for the activist scholars whose hard work and risk taking paved the way for this type of scholarship and established it as a legitimate contribution to our field and the academy as a whole. And what's more, they continue to create opportunities for this scholarship and mentor us. It is my hope that we will follow their lead and continue to build this area of work and mentor those coming after us, I'm looking at some of my students, um, as they encounter their own challenges and opportunities. Piece of advice number two, spend at least 30 to 60 minutes per day on writing and research. This is great advice to be sure, but no one tells you how much time you should spend on activism. And as you heard from Stephen, it's usually a lot. Um, and as most of you know, a lot of time spent doing activism isn't directly related to your scholarly work, but is based on you doing your part for the cause or the organization. So my advice, double dip. Understand and remember that your writing time is time devoted to activism. It is an activist practice. And your activism is time devoted to research, even if it doesn't seem like it at the time. Besides, such work sort of nourishes our activist souls. And when choosing how to use your time, remember what Larry once told me. If you want to be an activist, go be an activist. You are in the academy or came back to the academy for a reason. So ask yourself and remind yourself of those reasons. You are an activist scholar. Find the balance between those two wonderful gifts. Piece of advice number three. Don't teach too many new courses. <laughs> Again, good advice. And if you have a good chair, they'll protect you from this trap. 
or as was the case for me, your chair approaches you and says, you're interested in activism. Why don't you just go out for coffee with some of these faculty that are doing a project on human trafficking? The result of that little coffee break? Countless hours spent developing an interdisciplinary course for graduate students on human trafficking and teaching an overload every other semester. So my advice, get a Keurig and drink your coffee in your office. <laughs> In all seriousness, that, that course was a very unique and fantastic opportunity that I was very grateful for. But at least try to find opportunities to fuse your activism and teaching with your research and your writing. My colleague Natalie fixmore rise and I did this by teaching a course on communication activism and then writing and publishing about that experience. Again, under the mentorship of one of those badass social justice mentors on that flyer, Larry Fry. <laughs> Piece of advice number four, don't do too much service. Again, good advice, and if you have a good chair, they'll protect you from too many committee appointments. But what about the backdoor service that activist scholars tend to do? For example, as an activist scholar, you will get tapped by students, because what student doesn't want to work with a badass social justice <laughs> scholar, and to speak on panels or advise activist-based student groups. During my time at Villanova, I have been asked, because I'm an activist, to speak on panels on everything from Occupy Wall Street to homelessness to women in the media, and to serve as faculty advisor to no less than four student groups that focused on issues I had absolutely no experience with. So my advice, throw your colleagues under the bus. <laughs> or, more diplomatically, watch your ego and share the wealth. <clears throat> Uh, we only speak, only speak on those panels that, you actually, that actually relate to your research agenda and give invitations that relate to other areas to colleagues inside and outside of your department because hopefully other departments are doing activist work too. And finally, the last piece of advice, stay out of university politics. This is one of the hardest pieces of advice to follow, especially if a university decision affects our students, university staff, or our colleagues in unjust ways. As activist scholars, we are committed to fighting those injustices. So how can we stay out of the fray, or even should we? So my advice, which I gratefully borrow from one of those badass social justice mentors who isn't actually here today, be reflective. Will your voice speak volumes in this case, or are you losing the opportunity to use your voice to inspire your students in the future? Not just your current students, because as an activist scholar, you will have considerable influence on students for years to come. Analyze your impulse to speak. Ask yourself, is it an act of enormous courage or self-indulgence, or both, to speak on this issue? Know your power or lack thereof you will be given the opportunity many times over the years to do and speak in perilous political situations when it will count just as much then, if not more, as speaking on an issue now as a junior faculty member. Having to mute your voice on one issue will only make you more fierce and determined never to be silent in the future when you have more job security and power. So in conclusion, I wanna say that being an activist scholar is hard not only because it's a lot of work or because there are other obstacles politically and academically, but because we often have to make hard choices that involve conflicts among principled ends, a job we love, and our own self-preservation. Those choices are hard, but choosing to be an activist scholar is the easiest choice I've ever had to make. <laughs> Hello. Oh, I'm very humbled to be speaking here today with, of course, my other panelists who have inspired me so greatly, as well as the many scholars that are both present in this room and outside of this room at NCA, and even those who could not attend NCA. So I uh, thank you to them. And I'm very happy to talk to you today about the proposed activism and social justice division. I'd like to give you a little bit of the background and some, share some information that came about from the petition process. Uh, first, I have to say, looking back uh, two years ago when it was originally being talked about, 
It was being talked about, of course, in relationship to the social justice scholarship already present out in the world and in the discipline, but really it was born in conversation as a graduate student at the University of South Florida with two of my friends and colleagues who are, who are not here today, Summer Cunningham and Sarah McGee. We were really complaining quite a bit about not really finding a home in NCA for our activist work that we were doing and feeling quite a bit of frustration. And we thought, well, now is the time for an activism and social justice division. And of course, the work was already, already out there in place, so we were ready to do it. So a petition came about from that where we were seeking 100 NCA members to support this, to bring it forward to, of course, the executive committee and the legislative assembly. I'm happy to report that 186 people signed the petition. Uh, many of them were actually not currently members. Uh, 133 were, around 48 were not. And then we had also some signatures from people who had never been a member of NCA but were expressing interest in joining the organization if they could also find a home for their scholarship. So part of that was uh, in, in building that petition, we really wanted to get an understanding of what it was that that members were seeking from a division. Who were their inspirations, their scholarly inspirations? What were their goals and what would the purpose of this division be? And finally, how would they articulate their fit within their own teaching and research within this division? I'm very also pleased to report that of the 43 current NCA divisions, 42 were represented across the people who signed the petition, with a large number of coming from the Critical and Cultural Studies Division, the Rhetoric and Communication Theory Division, OrgCom, Performance Studies, Ethnography, Applied Communication, and the Feminist and Women's Studies Division, representing the highest number of affiliations. But 42 of 43, we have a lot a lot of people being represented here, so uh, definitely a need and a time for this. So of that, we, I kind of brought together, in, in, in association with the drafting and review committee, put the proposal together. So I want to put a warm thank you out to those who not only signed the petition, but who worked tirelessly to create the proposal. Eight, around seven to eight goals that people wanted to see this division uh, attend to. And many of this has already been echoed by those, of, uh, those that have spoken today and will also probably be by you as well. But just to go over some of them, and it's worded better than I could just speak off the cuff, so please bear with me. The first is to examine the power of communication as transformative and consequential in the service of activism, advocacy, organizing, social justice, and social movement acti activity, and thereby raise awareness and le leverage communication forces strategically to create a more equitable, peaceful, and sustainable world. I think this is very much mirrored by the the idea that communication is an ideal discipline to be at the forefront of social justice and activist work. Next, to utilize our communication resources, as previously said, our pedagogies, our practices, our philosophies, our methods, our theories to promote social justice in collaboration, to struggle together uh, in these difficult kinds of conversations. Next, to address injustices and inequalities by working for and with marginalized and underserved populations through our teaching, research, and service. To transcend the walls of the academy, to carry that work outside in partnership with local and global communities to intervene into unjust discourses. Also, to unsettle the binary between scholar and activist, to cut across disciplinary interests, to unite diverse voices, to bring together activist scholars, scholar activists, teachers, community members, so that we can really build a coalition of people working together as agents for change. Also, to provide a space, and possibly a safe space, and I've put safe space in air quotes, a safe space for scholar activists to challenge the status quo and ask important questions, important questions uh, across a range of disciplines about action and action, civic participation, participatory democracy, engaged scholarship, but really at the core to rethink how communication scholarship is done. How can we change it? What needs to be done? Also, to engage in lively and spirited conversations and debates about social justice if issues, but also to provide a platform for us to meet Share, share resources and gather, and to create a home for scholarly work that might not fit with other divisions, but to unite divisions at the same time, and to create a space where maybe more radical, progressive, and dare I say controversial 
efforts <laughs> can find a space at NCA. And finally, to create a relationship among scholars and activists who might not normally work together to address academic issues, issues that are really impacting our universities and our lives from the adjunct labor concerns to unionization of students and faculty to the corporatization of higher education to tenure and promotion issues, many, many things that we're, we're all in, enmeshed in. So how can we work together to do that to build a community? These were the primary goals that were brought forward from the petition to consider for the uh, the proposed activism and social justice division, which as was previously mentioned, it was meant to be voted on at our Wednesday legislative assembly meeting, but activist efforts uh, pushed that to our Saturday meeting. <laughs> so we will be voting on that and hopefully it will become something, uh, a new space for NCA scholars to gather and come together and to share and create networks where we can really build partnerships in our own local communities, but also, we're in CA gathers annually. What ways can we involve ourselves with activist scholars locally and continue this work? So that is, a, that is primarily what I wanted to speak with you about, is just to give you some updates about how, it, how the division kind of came into play, where it is, some of the information that was provided from the petition. And as we do that, I'd like us to transition uh, into discussing, first, if you have any questions of the panelists that have already presented, but also to hear from you, what kind of communication activism or social justice scholarship or teaching might you be engaging in? What goals or hopes do you have for a possible division? Uh, any other kinds of things that we can hopefully have a spirited or lively discussion about uh, the future of communication activism and the, and the presence of our future and if we have that, we have a microphone here for you to hopefully uh, rise from your chair and speak to us <laughs> as a way to, to uh, keep, the, keep the energy flowing. So if, I'd like, if anyone would like to start out, <laughs> sorry for sharing anything with us. First, let's give, let's give Chris yeah. <laughs> Is it? Is it on? Okay. I'm Amy Aldridge Sanford from Texas A&M and Corpus Christi, and I am so glad to see all the faces in here, and I'm so glad to hear about this division. I had no idea, um, I had no idea I was part of a trend, even, so <laughs> this is a very exciting, uh, uh, I will definitely join when this happens, because it will happen. Um, I want to step back a little bit. I'm, in, I'm informed by the feminist identification model, it's a stage model we borrow from psychology and counseling. And the fifth and final stage is activist ideas and movements. My students do not come to me ready for activism. Um, I taught in Oklahoma before I came to Texas, um, lived in the buckle, the Bible Belt, and now I've moved into South Texas, which is uh, very much influenced by Catholicism. Um, Oklahoma more Southern Baptist roots. Same concerns though, right? Students have these consciousness raising moments in the classes in which they take with me. Um, but it takes a while to get them to activism. And, and in fact, I've seen some frustration just with them dealing with a consciousness raising. Um, I'm wondering from you if you've had these same sort of situations in your own teaching, and perhaps other people in the audience have as well. I'm trying to address this by writing a book because I can't find anything that I can currently use. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts and ideas around that. Who wants to take it? Easy question. I'll, I'll address it. Everybody's looking at me. I don't know why everybody's looking at this end of the table. Um, so uh, I taught a course on communication activism. And, uh, and all of us up here, I think, have taught courses that have activism infused in them. And you're talking about writing a book, which I think is fantastic. Um, there's an edited volume, I think, <laughs> um, called Teaching Communication Activism, and um, edited by Larry Fry and David Palmer, that talks about these very issues that you're addressing. How do we get students kind of past that, that initial consciousness raising moment, even when it's very difficult to even get them to that point, to an activist sort of um, mentality? And um, also to echo something Stephen once wrote that's been a big inspiration to me is that activism as a way of being in the world, right? And so I talk to my students a lot about it's not really about your activism in terms of what causes you find most important because 
most students can figure that out, right? They can figure out, this is what's important to me and this is what I'm interested in, but then talking about how to nourish an activist sensibility in all parts of their life. So one thing that I talk to students about is, you know, you come to school and you learn, you know, particular job skills and you learn theories and you learn knowledge. Some of the things that um, I want to teach them, and again, Jason very much so wants to teach this, is what are the things that you're learning here that you can use in the other parts of your life that aren't your job? Right? Because you're part of all kinds of different communities, your church community, your, um, mm -hmm. your a parent teacher conference, your um, neighborhood, all of these ways that you are a part of a community. How can you take what you're learning and, and make it into an activist sensibility, right? And so making that sort of a part of their everyday life. And I work, I'm at Villanova, which is a Catholic-based institution. And part of the struggle there is having students whose definition of social justice is based in things that are kind of charity, right? These kinds of models, that, and which are great and important models, but I like to talk about giving them the tools to address structural issues, right? This idea of not the band-aid, but the structural issue. And they can apply those skills, right? That literacy, those skills to any kind of issue. And I think when you sort of take some of the, a little bit of the politics out of it for them, let them find their political voice in that, that then the, the skills become what's important um, that you can teach them instead of sort of them feeling like you're indoctrinating them. Um, to a particular political philosophy, which I think works a lot with, with students who are um, perhaps not on the political page that some of us are. And another thing to think about is, is to try to tackle this as a, as a curricular issue at the department level. Mm -hmm. so, so we've built a curriculum now where every one of our freshmen takes a required class that includes a service learning component. Now, it's just a, a one-day service learning component because they're first-year students. And so we start them out with a one-day service learning component. And then they all take a, a sophomore class that has a kind of literacy of social movements and literacy of social justice. And, and nobody goes into prisons or jails or homeless shelters until they're juniors or seniors. So we, we try to walk them up a kind of staged consciousness and action-raising ladder. And that's a commitment we've made as a department. And for those of you who are in difficult states. It sounds like you've always had difficult states. There's a group called uh, Campus Compact, and they're all, they're all around the country. There's offices, I, I think, in 49 of our 50 states. And if you call Campus Compact, I'm not sure how they're funded. I should probably check this out. But, but they're, they're <laughs> good. Presidents of universities. <laughs> there you go. They're good folk, mm -hmm. and they will help you structure a curriculum that might help address some of your issues so that you're not the only person doing it. So uh, that's what we try to do is we try to make it easier for everybody by creating a curricular culture in which we know this is coming. Yeah, and can I just add one thing to that because I know there are a lot of people who are doing service learning work which I think is really important and um, essential. But the, the nice thing about having the activist orientation is that much of the service learning work out there tends to, again, move toward this charity model. So if you have this inclination and this interest and this drive, you, you know, you, you can really deepen that service learning experience for the students. I think, for instance, um, oftentimes on our campus you go and, and there's this whole list of places where you could have your students and like, you know, none of my places are there because they aren't organizations, right? You know, they don't really exist you know, in, beyond a few people trying to make, a, you know, a dent in the world. But you can, and I think this is the other part, bring in some of those folks into your classroom or ask your students to go meet with them. That has been really profound, I think, for the students in my classes when, when an activist met with uh, uh, the students about how to organize to get better food in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. That was, I mean, they were like, they couldn't believe it. They said, wow. And this was like, you know, she's just rattling off like, this is a no-brainer, you know. And they were going, oh. <laughs> and so opening their eyes to some of the things that, that might be of interest to them in that way. Hi, Peter Jensen at the University of Missouri. And first off, I want to say, Larry, you know, you had a profound effect on me as a first semester master's student taking your qualitative research methods class, and then Stephen, my conversations with you and my time there. Um, one thing I want to say is, as uh, somebody who will be going on the job market, and obviously publications are going to be a very big deal, and then 
publications as a, hopefully a junior faculty member someday. And so I love this idea of a social justice journal in the social justice division. <clears throat> One concern that I have, it's just sort of a, a knee-jerk reaction almost as I'm sitting here and listening though, is, is a concern about siloing our research to a certain extent where, oh, well, all the social justice stuff goes in the social justice journal or it goes to the social justice division. And you know, you talked, we had 42 of the 43 divisions, there's an interest across. And so that would be my main concern if that's something that you are concerned about as well, where all of a sudden it becomes a panel, a bunch of social justice researchers talking to other social justice researchers and maybe limiting our audience that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, you know, that is always a danger, but you know, we've heard that argument before for things like qualitative methods. That, you know, if we had an ethnography division, you'd only see ethnography coming out of that division, or if we had a journal, and that just hasn't been the case. Uh, it is true that things emerge out of those divisions, but they still cut across. There are gonna be plenty of situations in which the work that's being done isn't necessarily highlighting the social justice aspect, but that social justice is a component of it. And in those particular cases, those are still going to go to lots and lots of other journals. So I take your point very seriously, but my experience has been with other areas of the discipline that just because you have a critical cultural journal now doesn't mean you don't see that work in other types of journals and other divisions across NCA and ICA and all the other associations. I think what it does though is that it does provide a home for people who can be evaluated by those people who do that work. You heard some of the difficulties of institutionalizing this work and it is true that you know, on, in some divisions or in some journals where you might or might not have somebody who has familiarity with this type of work, your work is being judged about that. And we've heard some pretty harsh judgments. And I think that the benefits of having people who do this kind of work evaluated way outweigh the kind of problems that you're talking about. I would also say, going off what Larry just said, I think it could also be a catalyst for other people doing more kinds of activist slash social justice work outside of the division, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be, it could inspire people to do more work, not just within the division, but outside of the division as well. So I, I think that that's very true, or very possible anyway. So. And I would definitely echo that from the responses that were on the petition that many people weren't seeking to to sever their ties with their divisions right. and, and, and silo themselves off, as, as you mentioned it. But instead, it, it was giving them perhaps permission to do work that they've long wanted to do but haven't been able to do maybe in other divisions and to find those that they could collaborate with uh, to do this work. So. Hello. Um, my name is Vincent Russell. I'm from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and I'm very fortunate to have SPOMA um, as a mentor so far. Uh, and so in my very limited experience thus far with uh, social justice research, I can't help but feel that communication ethics plays a really important role at kind of as a foundation for, you know, before you can really I have seen, felt like, you know, before you can really go out and participate in trying to make these changes in the community, you, you know, it, it's better to have an understanding of why do we make these decisions, what kind of values do we put into, you know, th this work or that work. And I was wondering if, if any of these panels, if any of you panels felt similarly about the importance of communication ethics or maybe it's not as important or, you know, just kind of your thoughts. It's really important. <laughs> um, as also a former student of SPOMA's, I have that, that background as well. And, um, and I think this is very much what SPOMA was talking about in terms of collaboration and sort of critiquing that practice. And I think um, ethical practice in, at its very heart is a critical practice. And I think um, even if you don't have the benefit of being one of SPOMA students, um, you get that, right? You get this sort of idea of being very critical of your practice. And I think that Stephen talks to this a lot too in terms of you know, men, you know, keeping these partnerships going and also trying to find this balance and that we need to be very um, careful about are we providing for what these people need? Right, so this idea of asking, does this organ, do I have, or my students have, what this organization actually needs? And if not, then can I send them to someone that 
that can help them? And I think that's a really ethical question is sort of, again, this watching your ego, right? I can't do everything. I'm not trained in everything. But, you know, so being able to say no because I'm not going to give you what you need and, and there are better avenues, I think, is a very ethical um, stance to take and I think one that you have to constantly sort of um, nurture. Yeah, I think that uh, what Stephen was talking about, about a sort of slow integration mm -hmm. into activism is really important. I do teach a course that you know, I label as pre-activism that deals with the kinds of issues that you're talking about, but it also deals with things like personal growth and sort of recognition of humanity and sort of working on themselves um, before they go out and work on others, in a sense, mm -hmm. and with others. And so I think that, um, yeah, we can't expect people to, people, one of the arguments against this work has been, well, you'll do more harm mm -hmm. than good. And, and that might be true if you approach it without examining ethics, without examining the kinds of, taking the critical stance toward your own involvement, your own work, um, that is really demanded of this. So you're right that we do need to provide probably some kinds of prerequisites, whatever that means, whether those are sections or readings or courses or, or and that kind of slow immersion into activism uh, probably uh, undoubtedly will be the best way to do that. And I would just also say, more of a, as a philosophical orientation, that there's no easy answers here. Mm -hmm. right? it is, uh, at least for me personally, it's an issue of constantly being open to the possibility of being wrong, constantly being open to the possibility of making mistakes, and kind of, you know, the more you do it, obviously, the easier it gets. You learn more insights, things like that. But for the most part, though, constantly be, being will willing to constantly reevaluate what you're doing, your orientation, your practices, et cetera. And I think if you approach it through that orientation, those ethical issues kind of come to the surface and you're able to deal with them. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. My name is Tim Huffman, and I'm an assistant professor at Loyola Marymount University. And uh, first off, I want to say that this is kind of exciting time. Uh, I know m most of you only by your words uh, and not by your faces. Uh, so this is great to all come together and to see these people. Um, I, I feel like it's a privileged moment. Uh, my question to you, I, I'm going to preface with a, a statement. I don't think it's very hard to convince communication scholars that their methods and theories are good for other people. <laughs> and, and part of the work of social justice communication scholarship is taking the riches, theoretical, methodological, ethical, conceptual, critical, out into the world to improve things. And so when I tell people, okay, that's part of what I do, usually it's, oh, that's really admirable, but how do you find the time? I think a more interesting question, and the one I'm going to pose, is can you reflect, and some of you have in your writing, but for, for all of us and for me in, in your words, how the work in and around the issues that we serve, the lived experiences of the marginalized, the lived experience of activists, serve to nuance, transform, and improve the work of communication me methods and research? In my own work, I have found that the voices of uh, people who live homelessly challenge basic theories about communication because they don't have the luxury of taking many things for granted. That when you study people who are in relatively the same social class, there are aspects of communication that we just get to ignore. And so that would be my answer to my own question, but I pose uh, it, it to you. Wh where is, is the work that we do? How do you see that speaking back to the, uh, the discipline as a whole? Well, that's a great question, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't have an answer to your question, but maybe just a perspective, which is that I think for all of us, we probably try to strive for some synergy so that our teaching feeds our research, our research feeds our activism, mm -hmm. our activism somehow enriches our lives <laughs> in, in innumerable ways. And I've really come to rely upon that as the place of my sanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what kind of departments you're in or what kind of universities you're in. It, it seems like, you know, you can just be banging your head against the wall all day long on minutia, you know, silly, stupid stuff. And when I go to the prison, it's like reality now. Mm -hmm. Those women are telling very real stories about lives of abuse and lives of deprivation. And it is so honest and so authentic and so much more meaningful 
than anything my provost has to say to me. <laughs> no, I mean, and seriously. And, and so it, it sounds kind of crazy to say it, but I mean, working with the population I work with is my reality check. And it, I think, has really made me someone who takes sexual violence more seriously. I just didn't think about it much when I was a young man. But now when I'm working with women who have all been abused, boy, that's, that's changed my consciousness. And to work with a group of women who have all been addicts has really changed my feelings about alcohol. Uh, so I think my entire life has been transformed by the people I work with. And I feel grateful for their sharing that gift with me. I think that's something we probably all feel is that we've come to love the people we work with uh, because they, they love us back and they change us back. And that's the beauty, I think, of the work we do is trying to, to, to reach that ethic of care and love. And what that does, I think, for all of us is it means when you get the provost on the line, I mean, I just laugh. I mean, on, I mean, like, things that other colleagues get freaked out about, it's just water off my back because the women in the prison are where the, the, the real work is. And so I think it's kind of made me chill out. <laughs> but I would, I would add here that, I mean, I think your point's really well taken in the sense that um, probably, and, and the work is still fairly young, has concentrated more on trying to show that the concepts, the theories, have some value mm -hmm. to the communities that are most marginalized and oppressed. And probably what we haven't done as good a job of, of how does that reverberate back into sort of new understandings of that. I mean, I, I would say even the notion of the first person perspective comes from there in the sense that somebody once challenged me. I was doing typical ethnography work and they said, well, how are you helping this situation? You know, and that started to really get me thinking about that. And I'm, I'm not saying that's a big insight, but, but it goes to your point about, well, where's, where's the reverse trend of really transforming our conceptions and our theories from the practices. And I'll grant you that really we have not focused enough on that. And that, that probably is the next generation of the research. I would, oh, go ahead. I would say building on that, I mean, obviously our, our teaching is a site where, where we have a lot of these conversations happening. And I think we often forget as, as, as communication teachers and researchers, activists, scholars, that that the, we are asking others to live in these constructed worlds, these theories and methods that we, that we are building. And we, when we ask other people to live in them, we, we often encounter out in the field, I'm sure all of you have probably experienced this, that the people don't live in the same worlds that we are constructing. And so often our communication theories and methods don't relate to, to, to these worlds. And that's what, kind of what I was hearing you say, Tim, that it's like you come back and you thought, Oh, this communication theory really didn't apply there, and, and maybe we to rethink these these whole ways that we have constructed the, our discipline and the research around it. I think is really important. I um, just want to add one more thing to that: is that um, one of the pieces I'm working on right now is thinking about activism as a model of research, mm -hmm. as a method, um, as a way of sort of what kind of questions do activist scholars ask, and what kind of things do we see. Um, as activists in the field that we don't necessarily see using traditional ethnographic or rhetorical mm -hmm. sort of methods, right? What is it that my activism um, adds to what I'm learning, right, in ways that um, I haven't, you know, that I can't get from these other sort of research methods. So I'm still mm -hmm. sort of, I don't have answers, right, but I'm trying to work through this idea of what does an activism scholarship look like in terms of method, right? What kind of things can I see that I don't see as just a participant observer and not as an activist? So I think that's one way of sort of getting at that question is how that speaks back to our discipline. Mm -hmm. My name is Elizabeth Jeter, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of South Florida. Uh, my research is primarily organizational, but I study human trafficking, um, which is primarily a labor-based issue at its core. Um, so something that I struggle with because my movement into being an activist scholar came from this tension between working within systems to try to change them and working outside of them. And both vantage points have their have their advantages and disadvantages. And I'm assuming this is something that will be talked about through this division as it, mm -hmm. as it grows in the future. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I'm interested in is both 
how, how you as scholars deal with uh, working with and partnering with for-profit companies because they're not just big multinational corporations, they're also small businesses in our community that can make as much of a difference mm -hmm. to disadvantaged populations as the government organizations and the non-government organizations that oftentimes this type of scholarship works with. Um, and also I find that my students more often than not end up in for-profit companies with their work and I want to be able to give them the tools to be able to work across those lines. So I'm wondering how you as scholars deal with that both in your own research, within your own communities and activism, as well as with your students to try to demonstrate that these aren't oil and water as far as for-profit and non-profit and government work. Uh, it's a wonderful question. We're actually out of time. If anyone has one, <laughs> if anyone has a quick response, but we're out of time, we have to, because we didn't record, we have to, we have to wrap it up. So does anyone have a quick response? Well, well okay. <laughs> very quick. <laughs> very, very quickly. I, I think one of the main messages that we can um, give to our students is that you, you can be an activist wherever you are, within right. a for-profit, within a non-profit, at school, in the community. And so that these, kind of getting back to what Jason was talking about, having skills and understanding and techniques that transcend all of those boundaries. Because it's true, our students will find themselves in all sorts of locations. And, and this kind of work can be beneficial to them in all kinds of ways, and our society. Absolutely. Thank you all for attending. I Thank appreciate you. it. Yes.